welcome and thank you for, for making the commitment to making uh, Ottawa a better place for children to grow up in. We are really excited about today and we have some wonderful speakers um, that uh, are going to share their passion with you and uh, their research and their knowledge. Uh, outdoor play, nature-based play, risky, adventurous play, all those concepts. Um, we wanted to celebrate it um, and bring in some speakers and really start to look at getting kind of back to the basics. So glad that I grew up doing what's on the left and not on the right. Uh, I truly did. I uh, suspect many of you did. And I suspect your children are like those on the right. And I have four children. And um, sadly, this is, this is sort of the reality of today and is the challenge that we have. And this afternoon, I'll talk a little bit more in the panel discussion about the need to approach both sides of this a different, different approach. One is to encourage and increase outdoor, active play, connection with nature. The other is to discourage screen time, indoor time. Kids today are spending three times more time indoors on digital devices than they are in nature. Contrast that to a century ago. Of course, there were no digital devices. We were almost always in contact with nature. 40% of Canadians say they get outside every day and 53% express a need to get out more often or a desire to get out more often. Okay. So less than half are getting outside at all on a given day. Why is it so hard to get our kids outside? So we've talked about this. The whole title of this thing is From Screen Time to Green Time. It's the screens which are one factor that are getting us indoors. So as a psychiatrist, I'm always fascinated. Why is it that screens are so addictive? Part of it is because we're hunter-gatherers, really. Our brains are wired for hunter, hunting and gathering. They're wired for survival. And so we seek out things which give dopamine and adrenaline. We used to get this from hunting and reproduction. And that helps us explain why we love our Hollywood movies with sex and violence. But before screens, how did kids get their dopamine and adrenaline? They went outside. And interestingly enough, when you go outside as well, you are spending face-to-face -face time with people. And that also gives your brain oxytocin. Here's the challenge. Modern electronic screens hack our brains by giving us easy dopamine. So why would you want to go outside from a brain perspective? Our brains are wired to want to get the most benefit with the least effort. Why put in that effort if you can just get your dopamine sitting on a couch? Our technology companies have figured out how to make things addictive. When I was a child, when you got in trouble, you got grounded, which meant you had to stay indoors. It was the worst punishment possible. And you contextualize that today. And it's a joke. It's like, well, as if I'm going to go out anyways, Dad. Like, you know. Um, and that's just in a generation or two. I like statistics. I think they're really important for understanding and contextualizing uh, a problem that we're facing. So when we talk about injury and risk and play, um, we did a little search in Ontario to see how many children are injured falling out of beds and how many are injured falling out of trees. So we looked at uh, four different age categories and it overwhelmingly uh, children are injured falling out of beds more often than they are falling out of trees. And so um, we need to consider the, the data uh, um, when we talk about risk. When somebody says, ooh, cartwheels are so dangerous, we should ban them, somebody needs to ask the question, how many people were injured cartwheeling in the last year? And then the person will either say, I have no idea because we don't track that. Or they'll say, well, one person. Or they'll say, well, I think somebody could get hurt. And, uh, and all three of those positions can be challenged. It's not reasonable to make a decision to eliminate um, a physical activity uh, on the basis of a feeling. Um, we have to have the evidence to do so. So the critical piece of understanding what risky play is, that doesn't mean playing with hazards. When we're talking about risky play, we're talking about introduce, it's play that involves the possibility, just the possibility of injury. But where do we know learning happens? Does learning happen when you're comfortable and you're doing the things you already know how to do? A risk doesn't necessarily mean the bad or harm or danger. It, um, like if you take a risk, I don't know if you're playing a game or something, you do something but because you might get something great out of it or something better. And so the idea of risk really comes with it. There's the potential for, for some harm and there's also potential for a lot of gain. Um, I think we need to redefine risk in a way that makes sense, it is appropriate and supports healthy child development. And, um, 
and we have to distinguish risk management in children's play from uh, the tools and the approaches that we take in industrial safety and road safety, um, where we see no developmental benefit to injuries in those spaces. And yet, uh, as Mark was, was talking about this morning, there are um, there's great learning from injuries uh, acquired in during play. Bubble soccer, you know this game where you run around, you wrap yourself up in a big bubble? It was too risky for some organizations. And I thought, for God's sakes, we have figured, finally figured out how to bubble wrap kids. And we're not allowed to do it. If we don't expose our kids to the opportunity to take risks in a healthy way through play when they're young, that they, so this is what the study is proving, they will explore unhealthy risks as they get older. So when we have kids in our programs, we have the opportunity to move them and to engage them. Part of it is to make sure that everybody has a piece of equipment and everybody gets to use that equipment as their interpretation of my instructions. I want to really think about that engagement. Kids don't know what to ask for. When I joined the school and there was um, word that, oh, the school structures are pretty much at the end of their life and about to come down and we need to fundraise for their renewal, I said, okay, I'm willing to take this on, but not if we are going to just be fundraising for like plastic and metal. I'm really interested in the um, creative spaces that children can play in, you know, outdoor spaces, nature, like green spaces, naturalized and more, uh, I guess unstructured environments where kids can be a little bit more creative. That advocacy for the affordance to create a culture of play in your school is absolutely essential and that includes the parents. So creating that culture to include the parents is essential. We're getting to the point of a tipping point. We're getting to the point where society is balanced, you know, the pendulum is going to switch back towards a healthier balance with nature and technology.